Welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis. And I'd like to ask you, have you ever heard it said, it can't be the Passover season yet because it's not yet spring. But what we need to ask ourselves is, is that man's tradition or is that scripture? I was called to the Hebrew Roots Movement in 1999, and at that time I was taught that there's two main seasons in the land of Israel. First comes winter, which is colder and wetter, and it rains approximately half of the week. Then comes the time around the spring equinox, the change of seasons, which takes place, normally speaking, around March 20th or 21st, depending upon the year. And then after the equinox, then comes the summer, when things are generally hotter and much drier. But traditionally, around the spring and fall equinoxes, the spring equinox happening on around March 20th or 21st, and the fall equinox happening around September 22nd to 23rd, you get a nice change of seasons. There's three or so weeks where it's, the weather's very pleasant, and that short sleeve weather and everything is just really, it's, it's a very nice time to be in the land of Israel. And traditionally, at least according to the rabbis, the feasts happen either during or around these three very pleasant weeks of transition around the time of the spring and the fall equinoxes. It's considered a blessing that Yahweh gives to his people. That is to say that the Passover and the wave sheaf are supposed to take place around the time of the spring equinox. Again, starting around March 20th or 21st, that's when the season is thought to begin. And then again in the fall, it's thought that the fall feast season takes place around the same general time, around the equinoxes. But let's ask ourselves, is this man's tradition or where is spring commanded in scripture? Many different groups believe in the importance of the role that tradition plays in the keeping of the feasts. But in Nazarene Israel, we believe rather that what's most important is to obey what Scripture says. So that's why in our study, Aviv Barley Simplified, we've seen that Scripture tells us to declare the head of the new year, in Hebrew called Rosh Hashanah, at the time when we see the first crescent sliver of the new moon, that we will be able to offer the very first sheaf of Aviv Barley, which we're defining as medium dough barley, 15 to 21 days later, on the day of the wave sheaf offering, called in Hebrew, Yam Hanafat HaOmer. And this is a very important time. This wave sheaf is symbolic of Yeshua. So Yeshua was presented, and then that cleared the way for the rest of the harvest. So the presenting of the wave sheaf pleases Yahweh. Yahweh then sanctifies the harvest, and this clears the way for the rest of the harvest. So now let us ask ourselves, where is spring in that? In this presentation, we're going to take a look at four other calendars, which tell us that there's a requirement for spring before the new year can begin. We're going to take a look at the rabbinic Jewish, or what's called the Hillel II calendar. We're also going to take a look at the equinox calendar. We're going to look at the lunar Sabbath calendar. And last but not least, we're also going to take a look at the Karaite, or what might be called the Sadducee calendar. And all four of these calendars involve spring in their calculations. So the Rabbinic Jewish, or the Hillel II calendar, was created by Rabbi Hillel Hanasi. Around, he lived around 320 to 385 CE, a little bit after the time of Emperor Constantine. This calendar was finalized somewhere around, they believe, around 922 to 924 CE. And it was originally created because the Jews were barred from the land of Israel. So therefore, they could no longer declare the head of the year based on the condition of the Aviv barley in the land of Israel. So they had to create a way to mathematically approximate the ripening of the Aviv barley in the land of Israel. 
So this is a mathematical pre-calculated calendar that actually is very brilliant considering the era in which it was created. It's amazing how good it is. It's not completely accurate, but considering the amount of time it's been in use, it's rather amazing. And in fact, it's still in use today. But there's some problems with the rabbinic Jewish Hillel II calendar. One major issue is that the rabbis have created a rule that the Passover cannot take place before the spring or vernal equinox. In other words, the rabbis have a rule that the rabbinic Passover cannot take place before spring. That is to say, the rabbinic Passover cannot take place in the winter when it's still cold, but rather, at least according to the rabbis, it has to be warm. However, Yahweh never says that, and if we go by the rules Yahweh gave us in Scripture, sometimes the Passover does take place before spring. Now, it's important to note that even the rabbis admit that this is not a correct calendar, and they want to go back to the original Aviv Barley calendar. In fact, I had the head of the Sanhedrin, uh, Rabbi Hillel Weiss, admit to me that they want to go back to the original Aviv Barley calendar, but they can't figure out how to get the people to do it. But that's another issue all of itself. So then the second calendar we're going to look at is the Equinox calendar. Now, this calendar, sometimes it includes barley, sometimes it doesn't include barley, but this calendar assumes that the year, again, begins only after the vernal or spring equinox. And the equinox is when the day and the night are of equal length. And this happens in the spring, usually around March 22nd to 23rd. And then again in the fall, around September 20th to 21st. And we're going to, we talk more about the pitfalls and the errors in this in a study in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 2, called The Equinox Error. And there's a great number of things wrong with this calendar. One of the big things wrong is that just in terms of adding the spring, that's against Scripture. Yahweh warns us very, very clearly in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. He says, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor shall you take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your Elohim, which I command you, meaning not the commandments you modify, not the commandments that you tweak by yourself, but I want you to keep the commandments that I tell you to do, how I tell you to do them. Again, he says in Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32, he says, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. And this is precisely what happens when we get into adding the requirement of spring or the spring equinox to the calendar system. So when we take a look at what kinds of things might be added to the calendar, Yahweh warns us in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 19. He says, and take heed. That means be careful. That means watch out. If you're not careful, he says, you're going to lift your eyes to the heaven. And when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the host of the heaven, you're going to feel driven to worship them and serve them, which Yahweh or Elohim has given to all the other peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. In other words, Yahweh has given these things to the Goy nations of the world. He doesn't want his people Israel to be paying attention or basing their calendars off of the sun, the moon, and the stars, except in the way that he tells them to. Now, there's a very old maxim in Judaism, which is whoever's calendar you keep, that's who you worship. That's a true saying if we think about it. So if that's true, and it is true, we have to ask ourselves, why are we doing what we're doing? Are we doing the things we're doing specifically because Yahweh said to do so? Or is it that we only think we're following what Yahweh said to do, but secretly we have some other hidden spiritual reasons that we may not be aware of? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves. In the sin of the golden calf, Aharon had the children of Israel break off the golden earrings that were in their ears, and he fashioned it and made it into a golden calf. And then when Aharon saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aharon made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. Now notice what he said, because it's very important. 
Aharon thought that he was honoring Yahweh. But Yahweh didn't feel honored because Aharon didn't do what Yahweh said to do. And that's the difference. So Aharon added something. Okay, we're talking about adding things to Scripture. Let's take a look. We have a study in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 2. We talk about the lunar Sabbath in detail, all the things that are wrong with it, in a study called the Lunar Sabbath Error. But we all know that in Genesis, uh, Elohim worked for six days to create the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and then he rested on the seventh day. And then in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3, then Elohim blessed the seventh day and set it apart, because in it he rested from all his work, which Elohim had created and made. And there's many different witnesses all throughout Scripture to this concept of working for six days and then taking a rest. For example, in collecting the manna in Exodus chapter 16 and verse 26, Yahweh tells the children of Israel, Six days shall you gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. So this is the basic concept, is that you work for six days and then take a break. And the seventh day is the Sabbath. It's right there in Scripture. It's very plain. But the lunar Sabbath people don't see it that way. The lunar Sabbath people have a completely different concept. So in the lunar Sabbath concept, they would say, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Yahweh doesn't mean count to seven and take a break. When Yahweh says count to seven and then rest, what he really means is to look up in the sky at the faces of the moon. You know, you can't make this stuff up. So the lunar Sabbath, and it's amazing how many people adhere to this concept. It's just, I'm I'm constantly amazed how many people believe this. So the lunar Sabbath people would tell us that this is a Sabbath when you can't see the new moon. And this is another Sabbath when the moon is half full. And this is another Sabbath when the moon is full. And here is another Sabbath when the moon returns back to half full. And then we're back to another Sabbath when the moon again is not full. So uh, now I don't know, but there's several problems here. Uh, One is that this is not what Yahweh said to do. And another problem is that it takes longer. Mathematically, it's impossible. So it takes the moon on average, give or take about 29.5 days, to orbit the earth, and this 29.5 doesn't divide evenly by 7. If you divide it by 4, you get an average of 7.375 days. So there's no way to get it to cleanly work out by 7s. So for example, let's just take a look at an average month right here. So here's one of those moon phases. They would say that this is a Sabbath. We count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, eight days to get to the next Sabbath. So you've got an eight-day week. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days. Okay, now we're back to a seven-day week. That's good. But one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here's another seven-day week. That's good. But now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days again to get to the next Sabbath. So if it's a 29-day month, you have three weeks that have seven days, and you have to have one week that has eight. Or in this particular example, you've got two weeks that are eight days and two weeks that are seven. It just simply, mathematically, it doesn't work. And there's all, they try to solve it, but there's, there's way too many problems. If you're interested, please read Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 2, The Lunar Sabbath Error. Now, some versions of the lunar Sabbath, they use the barley. Uh, and some don't, but they typically add a requirement for the spring equinox to begin the year. And again, we're talking in the context about adding things to the calendar that Yahweh says, not there. So with that in mind, now last but not least, let's come to the Karaite or what might be called the Sadducee calendar. Now, if you talk to the Karaites, the Karaites will tell you, they will claim that their calendar is the original calendar that was given to Moshe or Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, but it's not. And we explain what that original calendar is in our video study, Aviv Barley Simplified. And you can also find the transcript on the website. We'll have links below. So 
What's important to understand here, there's a lot of information, but what's important to understand here is that Aviv barley is defined as barley that is tender, young, and green. Because what Yahweh wants us to do is he wants us to bring him the very first sheaf of barley to present him with our first and finest, just like in Genesis, so that then he can sanctify the harvest, bless the harvest, and then this clears the way for the rest of the harvest. So, and we're defining Aviv barley as barley that is what's called medium dough. So it's not yet hard. It's still tender. It's still young. It's still green a little bit, although there's something very substantial about it. Well, the Karaites have a very different concept. And because of this, they have a completely, totally different definition. So what the Karaites want to do is the Karaites want to wait until most of the crop in Israel is already hard and brown and ripe before they will allow, before they will declare the harvest, before they will declare Aviv. That's because the Karaites want to bring in the harvest, and then they're not going to bring a sheaf first to clear the way for the harvest. They're going to go ahead and bring in the harvest and then bring a sheaf of that harvest to the priest. That's their concept. So in order to do that, because they're harvesting first, they need to have brown harvest ripe barley. That's what they're all about. Well, some more confusing factors to add into the equation. The term aviv means spring in modern Hebrew. Now, that's not the original definition. The original definition of aviv is tender, young, and green. So we're talking about things that are added. When you change the definition, that's kind of adding and taking away. You're taking away the original definition and you're adding a different definition. So, and we're not saying that the Karaites use this definition because they don't, but is it possible that this definition has influenced certain groups of people's thinking? Now, they haven't said exactly this, but the Karaites seem to believe that the term Aviv refers to the earliest time when whole barley fields can be harvested. And in their understanding, that takes place in spring because they say it cannot take place in winter. So notice the assumption here. They're assuming that it needs to be spring before they can declare the Aviv barley. Or to put it in other terms, they assume it must be after the spring equinox before they can declare the Aviv barley. Okay. Now we talk about how the Karaite theology violates scripture and also violates Yeshua's example in our video, Let's Not Break. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 9. And if you haven't seen that video, I strongly urge you to watch it. It's got a lot of great information in there. But let's take a look at how it applies to this year. So we have a, there's a very popular search, barley search team that's led by a Karaite. It's called Devorah's Date Tree. It's led by a Karaite by the name of Devorah Gordon. Now she's very clear. She says she's not an official representative. She's just simply leading what she calls an interfaith barley and new moon search team. We don't have any issue with her new moon reporting. Her new moon reporting is excellent. Uh, And she also documents what she finds fairly well in terms of the barley. It's just the difficulty is that she has a different definition of barley than Strong's. She has a different definition and a different understanding of what the Aviv barley is and what it's all about. So we would believe that that has to do with adding and taking away. Now, Devorah's date tree has ridiculed the idea publicly that the barley can be Aviv before the spring equinox, before March the 20th or 21st. So the reason, they haven't said this explicitly, but we believe that the reason that they ridicule it is because at least in their understanding, most of the fields need to be ripe for the harvest. They want to bring in the harvest first and then bring the wave sheaf. So that means that the fields need to be harvest ripe, and that typically takes place after the spring equinox. So now let's just ask ourselves the question, and I don't want to say anything negative, I don't want to say anything bad, but let's just ask ourselves the question, is it possible that the real reason that the Karaites ridicule the idea that the barley can be aviv before the spring equinox has anything to do with the spring equinox. 
Now, I don't want to say anything radical and I don't want to make any false accusations, but I just want to ask the question. It's just a question. Is it possible that the reason the Karaites ridicule the idea that the barley can be aviv before the spring equinox has something at all to do with the spring equinox? It's just a question I'm asking. Okay. Let's take a look at some of the things the Karaites say, or excuse me, that Devorah's date tree says. So she's going through uh, sample frequently asked questions, or she's paraphrasing. So she says, could the new year begin next month? She says, as I alluded to in my opening paragraph, it's still winter here. And it poured all of last week, just because that's what it does in Israel in the winters. It rains in the winter, and it doesn't rain in the summer. So she's saying, it's still winter here. In other words, she's saying, it's not yet spring. Now, just as a question, I don't want to say anything wrong, I don't want to say anything radical, but just as a question, isn't that the same thing as to to say, it's not yet past the spring equinox? And where is spring commanded in Scripture? She gives another frequently asked question. How was the weather? Because that's an indicator of spring. She says, it was just starting to get warmer on our first day. But then on the second day of our inspection, it got cold again. Now notice, isn't her assumption here that it must be warm, like it is in Israel in the summer, meaning after the spring equinox? Or if it's not warm, the barley can't possibly be aviv, and therefore it can't possibly be Passover. It's just a question that I'm asking. So now, in that light, let's consider again what the rabbis teach traditionally, according to the traditions and teachings of men. They teach that there's two seasons in Israel. That part's true. There's generally winter and there's generally summer. The winter is generally cold and it generally rains half the week. And then comes the spring equinox, generally around March 21st. It's March 20th this year. And then comes the summer, which is hot and dry. And there are, again, there are two very mild seasons around the two equinoxes. And many rabbis teach that the feasts always take take place either around or after these two spring and fall equinoxes. In fact, you can very often hear the phrase used, the spring and fall feasts, even though that particular term is used nowhere in Scripture. But is that truly what Scripture says? Because when we take a look at John chapter 18 and verse 18, it says, now this, we're talking about the time of Yeshua's sacrifice, which we know took place at the Passover. It says, now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coals stood there, for it was cold, meaning what? Meaning it's still in winter. It says, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. And what this means is that the Passover can be cold because Passover can happen in the winter. It doesn't have to be spring. There is no requirement to pass the spring equinox for it to be the Passover. Okay, now let's take a look at what happened in this particular year. Maybe you're watching this in a future year, but just imagine coming back to uh, the junction of 2020 and 21 we had some very extreme weather, which happens sometimes. So in December of 2020, we had about six weeks of sun, and it was unseasonably warm in the land of Israel. Now what happened in 2021, then the cold weather returned. Now what happens when barley does that? Barley sort of advances. Now the barley in the land of Israel ripens over a two or three month period about that. So when we got this warm weather, the barley began to ripen. It began advancing. And then the early portions of the barley reached what you might call a point of no return. And then the cold weather hit. And then the later barley sort of pulled back. I don't know if you've ever watched, but in spring, if you get a warm spell, the buds will start to push out. And then if the cold weather returns, the plants will actually retract the buds. The buds will come back in. But once they've reached a point of no return, once the buds actually open, it begins flowering, the plants have actually committed themselves 
And so then they won't draw back. They'll continue pushing forward, trying to make their seeds, make their babies and uh, procreate and continue the next generation, carry on. So, but we had some very interesting things happen this year. So we had a six week unseasonably warm period in December and, and perhaps in January. So uh, first it was unseasonably hot and then it was cold again. A, a sister by the name of Becca Bitterman found what you might call an early flush. This barley that had committed itself had gone past the point of no return. She found an early flush of Aviv barley on February the 6th. Now notice this is say about a month and a half before the spring equinox on March the 20th in 2021. But Devorah's date tree, and there was a lot of confusing factors in this particular field, a lot of very interesting, you could see Yahweh's hand all over this. But Devorah's date tree came in and inspected the field, and they said, there is no Aviv barley because according to Devorah's date tree, what they wanted to see was not the very first sheaf of barley to present to the priesthood. What they wanted to see was whole fields of barley. And so they were not, for some, their observer bias, they looked past the first flush and you can see them as they do their inspections. They were looking only at the second flush. I don't want to say they were consciously ignoring the first flush, but it's like they couldn't see the first flush because that's not what they were looking for. It's very interesting if you know what you're looking at to watch those, those inspections. So then on February the 22nd, now we're talking about a month before the equinox of March 20th, Becca Bitterman and her assistant Cindy they went south to Raim, Israel, and they found a second witness to the early flush of Aviv barley. Now, Devor's date tree came to that same field. Very interesting. So Becca will inspect fields and Devor will come in there right behind her and say there's no barley. But the reason that she's doing that, again, is because she's looking for harvestable fields, which only occur after the spring equinox, generally speaking. So now with that in mind, we need to talk about certain translation errors. Very interesting, these translation errors. So in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, now this is a passage that many people use as an alleged proof text for the equinox calendar or for the lunar Sabbath calendar. It's very interesting to take a look at this. It says something different. They talk about how things often get lost in the translation. It's very interesting because this passage, this verse rather, reads very differently in the Hebrew than it reads in the English and in many other languages. So let's take a good look at this verse. So Genesis 1 and verse 14, let's just go with the New King James here, the standard translation. It says, Then Elohim, or God, they would say, said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, of the heavens, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, the term seasons refers to spring, summer, fall, and winter. And that's based upon your solstices and your equinoxes. So when you read this passage, when you read this verse in English, you're saying, let the sun, the moon, and the stars be for signs and for seasons, meaning spring. Well, let's take that back to the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, that, that word right there is ulamoadim. So, u is just and. Le moed im. Moedim is plural. So, moed. So, then, if I can get it to advance here, there we go. So, the term we looked that up, it's Strong's Old Testament 4150, moed. And what it means is specifically a festival. It's an appointed time. So, properly an appointment. In other words, a fixed time or a season, but specifically a feast or a festival. So when we take a look at that, there's another translation. The Institute for Scripture Research Version says, And Elohim said, Let lights come to be in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and appointed times, meaning moedim, or feasts, and for days and for years. Notice, the seasons are not mentioned, only feasts. So where is spring in this verse? So when we start to add things like spring in order to justify 
the lunar Sabbath theory or the equinox theory or perhaps the Carryite doctrine of harvestable fields, we should consider again Deuteron- passages like Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, where Yahweh says not to add to the word which he commands us, nor to take anything away. Because if we do that, we're not able to keep the commandments of Yahweh our Elohim, which he commands us, because we're doing our own thing. And that's why he tells us to be careful to do what he commands us and not to add anything, and not to take anything away. And notice he says, take heed. He means be careful, be careful, be so very careful. Because if you're not careful, if you're not watching out, you're going to lift your eyes to the heaven, and you're going to see the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the host of the heaven. And if you're not careful, you're going to be driven. You're going to feel driven to worship them and serve them. And what that word means in Hebrew when it says, and serve them, that we have a study on about service in the Torah calendar study. And what that means is anything that it's your reason for doing it. That's what service means. So if you're modifying your calendar based on the equinox, you are serving the equinox in Yahweh's sight. That's what that means. That's why it's so important to pay attention specifically to what Yahweh says to do. So now let's ask ourselves, according to this true ancient Jewish maxim, they say, whoever's calendar you keep, that's who you worship. Are you keeping the Karaite calendar? Are you keeping the Sadducee calendar? But let's ask ourselves, why are we doing what we're doing? Are we doing what we're doing because we've been very, very careful with Yahweh's word? and We're following exactly what he said to do? Or have we added something? And if we've added something, does that mean that we only think that we're doing what Yahweh said to do, but really we've added something because we have some other spiritual reason going on in our heart? So in that light, let's ask ourselves again, where is spring commanded in Scripture? Shalom.